Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation on the European Union's relations with South Asia. I'm Shada Islam. I'm senior policy advisor at the European Policy Center, and we're delighted to be holding this discussion with our partners, uh, the Asian Institute of Diplomacy and International Affairs in Kathmandu. Uh, now, you may wonder why we're talking about South Asia at this time. Uh, it's a simple reason for doing so, but also a very ambitious one. The simple reason is simple. Uh, two billion people, almost two billion people in South Asia, so the future and the welfare of these population is very important for the world for geopolitical and geoeconomic reasons. Uh, also, the European Union here in Brussels has good uh, and very solid relations, trade, development, and political relations with all eight countries which comprise uh, the geographical entity known as South Asia. But this is uh, bilateral, and uh, I think uh, we all agree that if it was collective and if we could work together region to region, perhaps uh, the EU's policies would be more effective and more efficient. Um, the ambitious reason is also that we're not naive. We know that there are political and economic differences and that it's uh, political obstacles to this conversation uh, about South Asia regional cooperation. Uh, there hasn't been a, a meeting, a summit of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, since 2014. Uh, there was some spark of hope. There was a video conference on the pandemic that was held in March last year. The Pakistani prime minister did not attend, but all the other leaders were there. And there was an agreement on an emergency fund for COVID-19. But also at the moment, the world over really, everyone's talking about developing strategies for the Indo-Pacific. The European Union is also scheduled to do so and is actually drafting its ideas at the moment. And I think it's very important that South Asia uh, even though we're talking about China and Russia and India mostly, uh, that South Asia as a region is not forgotten when we look at the Indo-Pacific. The region, of course, we all know uh, is marked by a lack of connectivity. Trade relations are, are, are ad hoc and, and, and really fragmented. There's hardly any connectivity. And of course, uh, this makes it very difficult to deal with questions like the pandemic, like climate change, like education, and also building trade and investment links with an entity like the European Union. So that's uh, why we're here. And I brought together, we uh, with Sunil at, uh, the um, Kathmandu-based uh, Asian Institute for Diplomacy and International Affairs. We brought together four very eminent experts on this region. Let me introduce you to, uh, to them very, very briefly. Madame Mashfi Shams is Joint Secretary East at the Bangladesh Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Dhaka. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining us. She was formerly Bangladesh Ambassador to Nepal and was in constant contact with the SARC Secretariat there. And so we think it would be quite interesting to hear your views, Mashvi. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, from the External Action Service in Brussels, a European External Action Service, I have to say, uh, Yanis Djokarakis, I pronounced that well, I think, uh, Head of Division, Regional Affairs in South Asia at the EEAS. Uh, from the College of Europe, uh, the campus in Natalin, where I'm also visiting professor, thanks to Pascaline Winan, she's Director of Studies there, a colleague that I respect and admire greatly. And last but not least, Sunil Casey, Chief Executive of the Asian Institute of Diplomacy and International Affairs. Now, the rules of engagement are very simple. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to our panel, and then I'm going to open the floor to Q&A from yourselves. There is a Q&A box, uh, box sorry, at the bottom of your screens. Uh, please raise your hand, put your question there, and I will give you the floor. Uh, with the help of my colleagues, Natalie, Clara, and Ivano Di Carlo. So without further ado, I'm going to put the first question to you, uh, Mashvi. And uh, speaking earlier today uh, at the round table we had, the expert round table we had, you talked about South Asia as a region that must grow together, you said. And you said also that the major obstacle was not just political and economic, but also differences in mindsets about how to move forward. So my question to you is, can you explain this a little bit more and how do we overcome these, uh, these obstacles, if you like? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in the second round again. 
Um, you see, it's not uh, South Asian region as a whole. Initially, I mean, uh, before the colonial era, we used to be part of one uh, small, small principalities, kingdoms. We were all part of one big uh, overall South Asian identity. But during the colonial era, some of these uh, integrations and connections got disrupted. And after the partition, these uh, lines hardened when the borders and the boundaries were drawn. You know, the, India was partitioned and Pakistan and Bangladesh, we all emerged as um, countries and we had very strong uh, identities, uh, national identities. And it's very hard for us to let go of these identities and then uh, reintegrate. Uh, and sometimes we have conflicting interests also. Um, so uh, one of the best ways that I can think of, but you know, even then after that, there is hope because we, uh, even in the eighties, we managed to think of SARC it's a regional organization where all our leaders decided to, that we could work together and that we needed to work together. And that's why SARC was created. And beyond SARC, we also have uh, entities like the BBIN and the BIMSTEC. So the need to, and the, the idea of working together is very much there. Uh, how we can move forward is uh, by encouraging more people to people contact, more uh, encouraging more think tanks, Thanks, like uh, yours to work together uh, by encouraging more engagement between the political leaders. And uh, of course, uh, getting the physical connectivity in place. Uh, and as I was saying before, our physical infrastructure uh, is sometimes we develop it uh, with, you know, thinking only of our uh, internal needs. If we could harmonize that uh, and we could uh, keep it as a uh, building blocks, then it could help us to harmonize the entire regional infrastructure uh, for greater connectivity. And I think that's where the EU could play a very important role um, because EU, as you say, has very good relationship, bilateral relationship with all the countries. EU is also a very long, old uh, partner, uh, dialogue partner in observer in SARC. Uh, so uh, I think if EU could harmonize its activities, its bilateral activities with the countries, and um, you know, make it more of a region, take a more regional perspective, so that there's no duplication or conflict. I think that could greatly help us to move ahead. Ambassador, if I could just have a quick uh, follow-up. You talked uh, earlier as well because we had an experts roundtable just for those who were uh, not present, and we uh, spoke our minds. And if I could just bring forward one of the ideas that you brought uh, to the table, which I found very interesting, is about coastal connectivity and uh, coastal cities connectivity. And I was just wondering if you could just uh, further elaborate on that. Okay. Um, you see uh, the uh, ports um, like Chittagong in Bangladesh, Chittagong Mongla in Bangladesh, and then Kolkata, Vishakapatnam, and um, in uh, Sri Lanka, there's Colombo and um, Kandy, and then there's Maldives. So we are, there are, you know, like dots of uh, uh, ports are there, uh, but you know, these, uh, the waters are very shallow. For ports like Chittagong, Mongla, uh, Kolkata, uh, we need to transfer to a, um, from a feeder vessel, we need to transfer to a mother vessel uh, so that it can go for the ocean going transportation. Unfortunately, because there's no direct linkage between Chittagong and Colombo port, for trade to take place between Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, we have to take it all the way up to Sing Singapore and then bring it back to Colombo, which really adds to the cost. Uh, so if we could have smaller vessels, which would be uh, you know, uh, fit and suitable for the shallow waters and uh, they would not need to be so big and uh, they would be much cheaper to, for transportation. I think that would really enhance our, um, our regional trade uh, it would also um, improve our, um, you know, uh, overall concept of connectivity. And this would really, I think, because uh, again, going back to the colonial era, because in the British times, uh, the entire Bay of Bengal was one network of shipping linkages. So we could revive those shipping linkages and connect from like Vishakapatnam all the way to Indonesia or Chittagong to, you know, Malaysia or Thailand and Colombo. 
Right. Thank you very much. So uh, in, a, in a way, going back to the future, Ambassador, I'm going to ask you one more question because I know you have to leave. Uh, friends, uh, Ambassador's taken time out of a very busy schedule and I know you have to leave. So one, one more question. Um, one of the questions that has become, let's say, very, very important worldwide, but also for the region, especially for your country, is really the impact of climate change. Uh, and I was wondering if you could uh, give us an idea of whether regional, regional wide collaboration uh, with interaction with the um, European Union could be one way of managing, uh, if you like, this, this uh, challenge. Yes, of course, it's uh, one of our priorities because uh, Bangladesh is going to be one of the most affected um, you know, uh, due to climate change. Um, there's, they're predicting that uh, almost uh, 2 million people will be displaced because of rising sea levels in the coastal areas. But also increasingly we are seeing uh, you know, bigger uh, and more devastating cyclones uh, in the region. And also climate change effects of the him in the Himalayas, that's also affecting Bangladesh because the glaciers are receding and the glacial lakes are, uh, there's a problem of the outburst of the glacial lakes. So whenever we talk of uh, the impact of climate change, we always discuss, we always bring in the impact of climate change on Nepal and Bhutan, because you know, 30% of Bangladesh, the rivers that flow into Bangladesh come from Nepal. Um, the water from Nepal goes to the Ganges and from Ganges, it comes into Bangladesh. So we are really dependent on the Himalayan rivers and this uh, the entire uh, mountainous range. So uh, there has to be a regional approach uh, there has to be uh, bigger support from uh, the EU in this area. And uh, we are, uh, Bangladesh is taking over the uh, chairmanship of the Climate Vulnerable uh, CVF, the uh, Climate Vulnerable Forum this year. And we hope uh, together, uh, Nepal is also part of uh, Nepal, Maldives and uh, Hila, um, Bhutan are also members of that. So I think together we can really work for in that area. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and uh, good luck uh, on all these issues. And let's keep up the, the conversation because this is going to be very important as we go forward. Um, let me turn, thank you very much. Yanis, uh, 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 to come back to you, the Ambassador's made good points about there being an ambition in South Asia and SARC is one manifestation of that ambition of actually working together. Uh, but then political realities get in the way. And she also made the, the point that um, you could, as a, as a first step, as the European Union, uh, start harmonizing bilateral relations uh, as a first step towards bringing in a more regional dimension. Is, is the regional dimension in your minds at the External Action Service and elsewhere in the EU institutions when you look at this very fragmented and disconnected region, which is today's South Asia? Thank you, uh, Sandra. Actually, if I say it's not only in our mind, it's in our DNA. <laughs> I think we can also act as a model of integration, a deeper, not only economic integration, but also a political integration. It's also true that uh, in our in connection with our partnership with South Asia, indeed, we have a lot of uh, a number, actually, almost with almost all countries, a number of uh, cooperation and partnership agreements. And actually, in India is also one of our strategic partners in, in Asia as well. It's true also, on the other hand, that very much uh, progress has been made on the regional integration side and also on the EU involvement that, because uh, for us, it's mostly uh, we are eager actually to, to see this happening. We see the need. We also see the reasons. And there are a lot of, uh, as I said, good, bad reasons for that. And I think it's a matter that we can really facilitate to be sorted out, but at least certain fundamentals are not sorted out. Perhaps through examples, uh, good examples, I think that uh, there is a long, the path is quite long. On the other hand, we had an opportunity. Uh, I see that a lot of new initiatives were taken within the, because of uh, COVID to try to revive SARC, to revive also, they, there is also a need, and I think the COVID has also a, a wider impact of displaying, displaying the need for international partnerships, for all more multilateral approaches, for uh, uh, working together. And we, it remains to be seen whether this impact will be long lasting or we concentrate only on the health sector. So that's something that remains to be seen. 
Uh, I would also say that what your question is also very relevant also in connection with, uh, with the planning of our future cooperation with the entire world actually, because uh, we are now in the final stage of formulating our um, partnership assistance, I would call it. It's not only development assistance any longer, it's partnership to try to develop in the next seven years with all countries. And this is exactly the question that we face now in connection with South Asia. We, we tend to have a more geographic, that means we have to work more and more with partners rather than and try to cooperate all horizontal issues in geographic program, be it regional or national. We also have to have more political focus. We also appreciate that uh, after so many years of cooperation, uh, our support, the financial assistance is of somehow relative diminishing importance, but the needs are there also because of the success. And unfortunately the infrastructure does not accompany the growth, cannot support the economy. And we have to talk more and more about investment. And in fact, this is what is actually the motto of the new approach is we invest on a better world. And of course, we have to support investments because we know that whatever we provide is not sufficient. We need really to support the real economy, private sector. And uh, along this context, uh, we are eager to see how we can really create a certain paradigms. Perhaps by us starting a bit modestly, the needs are there, also connectivity is there. We talk about strategies. It was uh, in 2018, we have developed two strategies for Asia. One is connectivity, the other is for security. And we now also about, we started reflecting on the new Indo-Pacific outlook approach. It's very relevant there for this discussion. And I will say that I'm mostly on the listening mode because all these ideas have to fit into what we're going to do also and plan to do this year and beyond. And I look forward to this discussion. So I will stay, stay stop here for a time being and I'm really very keen to, to listen to others and also entertain certain questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yanis, for that introduction uh, and, and let's say your, um, your hopes of playing a, a bigger role, but also, of course, the realities on the ground that make that sometimes a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, and, uh, and as you said, with, uh, you've had a connectivity strategy, uh, a security strategy, and now the Indo-Pacific outlook. And I guess the, uh, the question uh, I would put to you, um, Pascaline, um, if I may, Professor, uh, Winant, bring you in. You've heard what uh, uh, Ambassador Mashvi has said and Yanis have said about, you know, the aspiration in many countries in the region of working together, but also the realities on the ground, the political differences, the, uh, let's say, the fragmentation, cross-border uh, cooperation is, is the challenge. A lot of uh, informal cross-border cooperation does take place. Uh, but that is uh, very ad hoc and very sporadic. Uh, from your point of view, um, do you see South Asia getting its, uh, let's say, the kind of uh, attention that it should be getting uh, from the European Union and others, or is it being distracted? Is the EU distracted by the great power uh, co co constellation that we see around us? So United States, China, India, Russia, and South Asia somehow gets sidelined in this, uh, in this conversations and these strategies. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you know that I've been doing a, a lot of uh, interviews uh, about the relation between uh, India and the EU. Uh, and indeed, one of the, the frustrations that comes to the fore is always that the EU is giving more attention you know, to, to China. Um, so there's frustration on, on that side. Another frustration, if you talk about the big powers, is that the EU somehow uh, does not have its own strategy that's very, very separate from that of the, of the US. So there is a regret on the part of some partners in the region that, um, and, and I put it very plainly here, that sometimes the EU acts as the poodle of the United States. Now, of course, this may change between different American administrations. And there's been uh, recently, I think, more of a coming together of uh, India, um, with the European Union um, in addressing both the challenges of China and also uh, perhaps the less engagement of the US uh, in the region. But that might all change, of course, with the, the Biden administration. 
So I don't know if you want me to elaborate. Yes, on a little that. bit more uh, on how South Asia feels, uh, as you said, the, the frustration in India, but we're talking about the wider region. Um, do you think there's yeah. a similar kind of feeling that China gets too much attention or ASEAN even, where we've recently signed a strategic or uh, concluded a strategic partnership? And, and you could argue that South Asia itself is very fragmented. So, you know, the European Union has no option, as Ian has said, but to engage on a bilateral level. Um, how do you see this going forward? Well, what I see is that you certainly have several regional arrangements in Asia, the Asia Pacific, the Indo Pacific, and, and some, of course, uh, with overlapping uh, memberships. And I think one of the problems is that you have divisions and hesitations among Asian countries on the scope, membership, and purpose of regional cooperation in South Asia and more broadly Asia. And the different attitudes of key countries in Asia and in Europe towards these organizations, and even in the terms being used to describe the region. So on the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific, you know, uh, if you look at the ASEAN attitude, there would be a big focus of going to, to have ASEAN as the center uh, of this. Uh, if you look at the EU right now, I saw that Joseph Borrell uh, in uh, November last year spoke of the Asia-Pacific as our economic neighborhood. And then he mentioned in the same, uh, during the same uh, communication that the Indo-Pacific region was of strategic importance to us. And it's clear that the Indo-Pacific will be the most dynamic region in the world and the center of growth for decades to come. So, and you know, I think individual countries also within the EU have their, their own take on the, what, what it means, you know, the, the Indo-Pacific. Um, also what I think we shouldn't forget is that these organizations have sought inspiration in developing themselves from their own region, but also by looking at, by interacting with other regional organizations and international organizations uh, in Asia, in Europe, and elsewhere. So we should remember, be a little bit modest here, that the EU is certainly not the only game uh, in town. Um, and um, we should try and see, um, if we look at the interaction of the EU with organizations in South Asia, what, what we can learn from this interaction. And earlier, I think today at the round table, we're talking about whether we, the EU should prioritize some of these regional organizations. I think we should learn from the history of what we've already done, you know, with these regional organizations. And certainly when you were asking me about ASEAN, SARC and, and, and so on, certainly what, what we can see is that at first the EU gave definitely more attention to ASEAN than to SARC. And there are many reasons for this. Some originate in SARC itself, with India at first not really wanted to have any interference of external powers in SARC, including via foreign aid, Whereas some of the other members of SARC, where the smaller countries were quite interested in getting funding, you know, from external partners or, or, or like the EU. Then finally, when we decide to actually really accept you know, such funding, uh, it is on equal terms and without conditionalities. And I think I looked at you know, the kind of history of what worked and what didn't work in interacting with SARC in, in, the, in the past. And I think there is also, it's not just about SARC, you know, not getting its acts together, not being coordinated properly with all the divisions and so on and so on. It's also about the EU. And I think in proposing certain initiatives, that there's been uh, on the part of the EU, um, some lack of understanding the local context um, on trying to involve, of trying to involve local actors in designing some of the projects. So they're not just all ready-made and here you go, you have to accept it and that's it. So I think that's something we could learn from the future to understand uh, the local conditions a little bit better. Um, and um, I think then to build a project within partnership uh, with uh, these, uh, these actors. Um, I could also talk about ASEM. Um, I think the EU support the inclusion of South Asian countries in ASEM from the beginning, but then we had the problem with Southeast Asian countries being opposed to this. Why? Because they said, well, you know, we have all this conflict in South Asia, do you really want to bring them in? And also South Asia is not growing as fast, you know, uh, as we are, so do we really want to bring them in? And, and then there were also these problems surrounding uh, whether 
um, you, the, the, how uh, ASEAN uh, handled the situation uh, in Myanmar and the human rights situation. Um, and uh, so, so in the end, in fact, this um, became a problem for India because you know, um, enlargement seemed to be predicated on, on solving the, 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 the Myanmar problem and on different perceptions uh, between different conceptions between the EU uh, and ASEAN on, on human rights. On human really. right. yeah. And then in the end, in Jadros, but only in 2006, you know. So you have all of these differences between mm -hmm. different perceptions uh, impacting our potential partnerships, uh, I would say, uh, with, um, with South Asia. Right. And then, oh, okay, maybe I'll stop now. I have more to no, say. No, but about what you, thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much. And you mentioned Myanmar, and of course, that is once again a, a hot potato in our hands and will impact not only on Southeast Asia, but on neighboring Bangladesh and, of course, uh, the countries of South Asia as well. No, we'll come back to some of the very valid points you've made about understanding local conditions, but also the layers of regional organizations that exist. For instance, um, it's just a, 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 some, a thought in my mind, a SART has diminished uh, influence and if you like attraction, but the Shanghai Cooperation Organ Organization, SCO, India is there, Pakistan is there as well. So is Iran and Afghanistan. So it's quite interesting that some of the countries in South Asia, Yanis, are paying more attention to the SCO, see it as perhaps more geopolitical and geostrategic than SARC itself. Which brings me to Sunil. Sunil, uh, would you be able to turn your video on so we can see you as well as hear you? Is this a possibility? And while I turn to Sunil uh, and ask for his comments and uh, intervention, may I ask all the participants uh, who are listening to us and watching us to start sending in some questions and uh, some commentary that uh, I'll be happy to put to our panelists and say we'll respond to you. So I'm looking forward to getting your questions on the Q&A uh, box here on the, on the screen. And Sunil, you've been listening to what Yanis and Pascaline have said, and you were very eager for us to work together on this South Asian dimension. So please, let's hear your comments. Yeah, hi, Sada. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, like, uh, if we talk about, you know, South Asia and you, you know, what I focus uh, is that, you know, uh, currently, like, you know, the India has uh, not much more interest into the SARC uh, revitalization, basically, even if we uh, initiated, you know, to bring some of the... Uh... Sorry, frozen. Sunil is frozen at the moment. I uh, think you... SARC export. Sunil, you'll have to perhaps come in again because your uh, your technology. I think you're driving on the highway somewhere. Yeah, are you hearing me? Yeah, now, now, yes, please. Yeah. So you know, like uh, what, what I believe is like you know, uh, as, as you know, like Nepal's uh, biggest neighbor, India. You know, they have quite focus into the domestic and BBIN, you know, rather than uh, SARC, uh, SARC association. So that what I would like to say is like, you know, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, you know, other smaller countries, they are quite interested, you know, to have the SARC, uh, you know, the next conference, uh, which is headed by the Pakistan. But due to India, you know, like uh, somehow things uh, are not uh, happening because of India, you know, Pakistan tensions might be India has shifted their focus to the sub-regional cooperation like uh, uh, BMSTEC and BBIN. But if you talk about, you know, like the BBIN that, you know, uh, there is a, you know, motor vehicle agreement between Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal, but uh, Bhutan somehow, uh, you know, like uh, not interested to, to be a part of the uh, motor vehicle agreement uh, till the day and they have not rectified from their parliament yet. Even Nepal, uh, even not rectified from the parliament uh, regarding the motor vehicle agreement. That is, you know, uh, how, you know, like that shows that, you know, uh, the countries are quite interested much more into the bilateral level engagement. That is what I feel here uh, in the country. But, you know, like, uh, but as a scholar, like, you know, we feel that, you know, there has been much more cooperation between uh, South Asia and European Union. And uh, there, if we see that uh, there has been larger, you know, bilateral engagement, even from the uh, European countries, like if you see like Germany is one of the biggest uh, diplomat partner for uh, Nepal among the SARC, uh, among the uh, European Union uh, here in Nepal. And we have the, you know, EU delegation office uh, 
uh, in carpentry as well, uh, representing and uh, doing uh, multiple projects, uh, basically in the development sites. And I would like to stress my point that you know, uh, ne you know, like South Asia, even especially the Nepal. Uh, Meant, uh, with the European uh, Union and with the EU countries, which uh, have been lacking since uh, many years. And Nepal has been quite, uh, you know, like uh, interested and focused uh, to bring uh, much more investment and have the trade engagement with the European Union. And that should be the uh, next focus between uh, EU and South Asia. Even the economic diplomacy cooperation uh, could have the next uh, startup between, you know, the uh, SARC and the uh, European Union, because economy is another, you know, the uh, the most important vehicle for our, uh, you know, uh, better collaboration or the uh, better engagements, and which will uh, bring us uh, much more closure in days to come. Uh, so, you know, like uh, my, you know, points are much more into the economy. So, I would like to say that uh, you and uh, Sark has to. Uh, focus basically on the economic engagement and the trade engagement and other uh, connectivity projects which are much more needed in uh, days to come. So this is how uh, I would like to say, Shada, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Sunil. I'm going to uh, ask you a couple other questions because we tried, uh, as you know, uh, Sunil, we tried to get a representative from the South Asian Association regional cooperation SARC to attend this panel and it was very difficult uh, to do so. Um, your prime minister has said that he wants to give a fresh impetus to SARC. Uh, given all the impediments that you have talked about, um, are, you in, are you in his confidence or do you know what the foreign ministry in Nepal, currently president of course of the SARC, presidency of the SARC, do you have any idea of what is planned in terms of giving this fresh impetus? Because in, in many ways, the COVID-19, as we said uh, earlier, has given uh, a regional dimension to the question. There are certain, let's say, uh, similarities in how Pakistan and India and Bangladesh have coped with the pandemic. The impact on health has been less devastating than initially um, anticipated. Of course, economies have been hit very hard. So um, what are, how can we give this new, because SARC, whether we like it or not, remains the prime regional organization in the region, the most comprehensive one, if you like. Yeah, you know, like uh, I, uh, you know, totally agree with you that whether you like it or not, but SARC is a very important organization for uh, South Asia, and uh, you know, the recently, you know, there was the uh, foreign ministers levels uh, meeting as well virtually, and there was, you know, like the, you know, COVID uh, after the COVID nineteen, you know, like India uh, inserted the virtual dialogue even for. The COVID nineteen. Uh, uh, and you know, like recently, our prime minister uh, has uh, spoken very well that Nepal uh, wants to have the you know the conference. Uh, our you know foreign minister and the Pakistani. But you know, like recently, if you see that uh, Nepal has been facing the political crisis just a month back, that uh, the Nepalese PM uh, himself dissolved the parliament. Even uh, the Nepal is having the crisis uh, on its own constitution, which we promulgated uh, eight years back. So now the political crisis is happening, but uh, our people and the government uh, uh, really wants, you know, to have the uh, SARC uh, conference that is going to be happening in Pakistan and uh, our foreign ministry and the. Pakistani foreign, you know. Sorry, we, have, we are having yes. connectivity problems. Yes, Sunil, you were that saying that the next I conference. That from yeah. Do we have a do we have a, yeah, a tentative date? In, uh, Pakistan. Do we have a tentative date yeah. for that? So you know, like what I feel is that you know uh, somehow there has been uh the date. No, 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 not yet, not yet, not finalized yet, not finalized yet. But this year? No, no, no. Date has not been finalized yet. Okay. 
Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Let me let me yeah. uh, let me see if there are any further questions. Like some of the some of the key things that Yanis uh, we have talked about, and uh, uh, Pascaline for you as well, um, is uh, the issue, as uh, Ambassador Mashvi said, of uh, climate change, where the European Union's Green Deal, um, which is you know uh, could become a global, if you like, as uh, benchmark for what can be done. It, it will create a great deal of complications as well. Not all countries are ready to go down that route. And of course, there's also the question of the uh, maybe a carbon tax that could be involved. Um, so climate change is one area that has been identified as one that obviously affects South Asia across across the region. Uh, the other one is connectivity or rather lack of connectivity and where um, the EU's strategy uh, could become kind of another sort of benchmark for how to proceed for further. So I was just wondering, Yanis, if you could comment on those two areas where there seems to be a kind of consensus require priority uh, attention. Thank you. I think that's a denial, actually. Uh, first of all, let me say to you that the uh, uh, European Union, of course, is one of the leaders in the fight against climate change. Uh, we are very much aware about the difficulties we face and the need that uh, we need to work globally and act globally. And despite what we do here in Europe, unless and until other partners and major polluters uh, really uh, work together, we cannot really have um, uh, results that can really reverse the phenomenon. Of course, this is also linked uh, to environment and biodiversity. These are somehow interrelated. And it's also for this reason also that this green deal uh, was um, one of the major priorities of the new commission since it was established last year. And this Green Deal does not apply only to the European Union. We see how we can really work together with other partners. And this is also because in a new uh, seven years plan to partner with uh, all the world, we have set aside and we have a target of invest not less than 30% of the total uh, amount to the fight against climate change. That is, I think, is uh, policy numbers. Uh, we know also that yet this, as I said, is, going to, is not going to be sufficient. We now work uh, with uh, in every single part, uh, country. Our delegations work intensively to identify priorities, and I'm very happy that based on preliminary uh, assessment we have on the spectrum of the proposal that came forward, of course, green transition, renewable energy and support on this transformation of the economy, which is also an economic issue, is very much in the, uh, in the key and in the core of all actions. Uh, this has to be done, of course, uh, nationally, and we can also see how we can see it also from a regional uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, there is work in progress on that. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, we know that it's a question of the will of the member of the partner countries. And of course, they have their own development plans. They have also to support the growth of the economy. We still have um, a lot of countries that endeavor to become upper middle income countries in the next in a few years, despite the temporary uh, problem caused by COVID. We know it to be overcome sooner or later. Uh, and therefore, it's necessary really to partner and make sure that the growth expect to explode perhaps in the years to come is going to be sustainable and this is actually where the focus go uh, as i said is uh, something that we still work and i'm sure that perhaps we can exceed the particular in asia this 30 percent thank you thank you very much Yanis. so there's a question from uh, rosina spinoy uh, and i think uh, natalie if you could give her uh, the floor she has a question on connectivity and uh, that I think uh, both Yanis, you, Pascaline, and of course also Sunil would be, uh, I think, well placed to answer. So, Natalie, can we go to Rosina, please? So she can ask a question herself. Rosina, floor is yours. Uh Sadly, the, her version of Zoom do not allow me to give her the floor. Ah, I'm very sorry. Can she can she take the floor herself? N no, she can't. 
Okay, so uh, let me read out. Uh, let me read out her her question. Uh, it was about uh, yes, about connectivity, uh, Yanis. So it was about the the outreach uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative of of China across uh, the region. Um, also, of course, uh, obviously in Pakistan uh, as well. And about how we can is there. Um, is there an interest, she asked, from the European level to connect further with the Belt and Road Initiative and, and uh, on connectivity issues with, with the region? So Yanis first, and then I'll turn to Pascaline. Yes. Uh, although, let me clarify that although the connectivity strategy was adopted in 2018 only, the European Union was very active in connectivity for decades. It was just that we didn't do it in a very, I would say, strategic political angle. And we tried to group together all these elements into a new strategy. Uh, so, and I would like also to reiterate that this strategy was not developed as an anti-PRA. Certainly, it is true that uh, the strategy encompasses uh, the, has a narrative that supports sustainability. Uh, it supports uh, also viability of investments. And uh, I'm talking about financial viability, which is also very important when you invest uh, such amounts of money in developing economies that they need also to have sufficient flows to repay the investments. And also we support the very much needed area where we can really try to identify common norms and standards in order to be interconnected and communicate. Uh, and uh, I think there is also work to be done there globally. Um, so what we have not done so far, and this is what we plan to do, is to accompany this um, um, this endeavor with certain, um, I would say, more visible projects uh, through, and this is exactly what we have also put aside, an investment fund under the new regulation, which is going to support infrastructure investment. As I said, it's not really, we can never support such investments alone, and we should not in reality, such investments in principle should be really say, able to uh, repay back. And also, a test for that will be really the participation, not only from financial institutions, and also, but also from the private sector. So this is what we have also expertise in house of the European Union. I think we have a know-how that we can really export and can provide this technical assistance, if I may say so. And of course, we are keen, and of course, we already cooperate also to a certain extent. We work with China to see how we can really work together. And of course, we are also members of the... Uh, uh, of, the, of the new bank that was international bank was created. So, what I want to say is that it's, there is work on progress on that, uh, and it's necessary also that uh, we have to work in third countries as well as well, uh, not and with third countries. So, this is what we try to do also with Japan. We have the first partnership. We are also I'm very happy to say that uh, there is uh, a possibility to progress soon with the connectivity partnership with India, which is extremely important for the regional dimension. Uh, there is still a proposal that was tailed by India, and we have now to contemplate and come up with a, uh, with a joint partnership. I think the ingredients are there. I cannot say much more because we're still at the beginning. But these are also very positive uh, developments, I would say, also in the light of the next uh, financial perspective. I will stop there here, I think, and uh, I will basically leave the floor to Pascal and perhaps to complement. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Yanis. Yes, absolutely. Uh, very, very uh, good points about uh, how we can take perhaps the uh, partnership with India on connectivity uh, and with Japan could be stepping stones towards a broader regional dimension to it. Uh, Pascaline, um, so this is obviously a moment where the EU is in the midst of rethinking uh, where we have the Biden administration, as you pointed out, in the US, which is obviously recalibrating some of uh, Donald Trump's follies, if I may put it this way. Um, but you also have the European Union, which is in the midst of rethinking many of its uh, Asian um, policies, strategies, Indo-Pacific strategy or outlook is coming up. And, uh, you know, they're thinking of these connectivity partnerships. Any, any ideas about how one can take this forward so that we don't, as we get into this great power geopolitics, forget uh, as Sunil was saying, that the smaller countries of South Asia are very much part of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you have to unmute or somebody has to unmute? I am not unmuted. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, 
Okay. Um, I think when you talk about connectivity, I think I heard um, um, an expert, I think from the external action service the, the other day, saying that it is actually in our DNA, connectivity, as the European Union. So it's part of who we are. We are all about connectivity, right? Um, now, when you talk about um, the, and I, I hope I'm addressing your, your question partly, when you talk about co connectivity with India and when you talk about connectivity um, with China, um, I think uh, what's been uh, a problem for both India uh, and the EU is, um, I would say, the encroachment of what is perceived of the encroachment of China in what they also perceive at their respective neighborhoods. So that, that's been one of the problems. And I think very diplomatically, the EU is playing both sides. Uh, so it's, it's trying to be friendly with India and also with China in here because of, uh, um, of course, the, the, the strategic importance of, of the region for EU trade, for energy, and then the, the same, you know, for, 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 for India here, for the whole stability of the region. If we don't have a stability uh, in, uh, in this region, uh, certainly we will suffer economically. So, you know, but so we're trying to, to play both, both ways. Um, about the small countries uh, in, in the region, if you look at regional organizations uh, in uh, South Asia and the broader region, because I, I don't think we can really limit it to, to, to South Asia, um, you see that uh, India uh, uses SARC, you know, or it's trying to use SARC when it suits uh, India, and then we use a subset of SARC, you know, like the BBIN um, countries, when it tries to achieve, for example, uh, uh, an, uh, an agreement on uh, motor or railway transportation, right? It, it didn't completely work, but certainly it's trying to do that. Uh, it, it's also um, using Beamstack. So you, if you remember that the first inauguration, you know, Modi SARC uh, leaders were invited. The second one, yeah. it was Beamstack leaders, right? It's a very strong, uh, uh, st strong message there, um, and. Um, of course, when you have a problem with Myanmar, that's going to affect the whole strategy of India there. But basically, what I think um, Modi has been saying is that we don't privilege any. We are using whatever suits us. I mean, I think I can even find you a quote there. Huh? So we're being very, very pragmatic. And what this means for the, the smaller countries is that you have to adapt to this. So for instance, Nepal is very much in favor of SARC. Uh, you know, uh, because it, it suits its own interests and it has also special ties with, uh, with, with China as well. As if you look at the issue of China within this organization, you will see, for example, that there's been a big uh, debate on granting new observer status uh, to China or even if China should become a member of SARC. Uh, and that's pitting some countries against others with some really very much wanting a, you know, a larger role for China and India not wanting this at all, for example. Uh, so, 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 so this is the richness yeah. and, the, and the complication of this yeah. region. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pascaline. Absolutely, the complexities that are there. Um, can I give the floor to Jan von Herf, please, who has a question? Natalie, could you uh, ask if he can come in and ask the question himself? Jan? like to ask the question? Jan, you have the floor. You just have, we can yeah. hear you. Uh, unstable connection. Let me go back to his. Oh, yes, his question. Okay, he, uh, the question he had uh, was, I think, actually, Sunil, you could also perhaps answer it. Uh, he was saying, how do strategies like self-reliant India, or also the strategy of Sagar, how does that uh, work in the um, regional, inter-regional context? Uh, does it make uh, fostering closer cooperation easier or even more, more difficult? So uh, Sunil, you must have been, uh, if you can come in now and maybe respond to that, I can also turn to Pascaline, of course, who follows these things. Um, Sunil, can you, can you answer that question? 
Maybe Pascaline, you can kick off uh, with a response while Sunil uh, reconnects. Yeah. Can you unmute uh, Pascaline? Yes. Yeah, no, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you uh, mute, unmute Pascaline, please, Natalie? I'm trying, but when I'm unmuting her, she's muting herself. So okay. Pascaline, don't move. Yours, Pascaline. You, you just have to unmute yourself now. Ah, OK. Yes, I think we're both pressing on the same. Yes, right, yeah. at, the, at the same time. So what was the, the question? It was about uh, what about the self-reliant right? India, and then you know how does is I mean if every country uh, is on its own self-reliant and uh, you know path uh, in terms of looking after its own national interests, something that Ambassador Mashvi talked about as well. I mean, does that is that conducive to and in Pakistan's doing the same thing, Bangladesh? Is that conducive to uh, cross-border cooperation? In inter-regional cooperation, intra-regional cooperation. No, I, 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 I don't think so. But I think you can say something and act uh, in a different way. It, it's obvious that in the region, India is trying to, 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 to partner. I mean, you, you gave the example, for example, of, um, well, of the COVID nineteen emergency uh, fund. That was an, an initiative of of, of India. Um, now, of course, it ran into some problems. Uh, when uh, there was talk on how this emergency fund would be administered, with India saying what each country is going to, to, to do their own thing there, you know, and uh, we're not going to control it at all. And then Pakistan objecting to the fact that actually there was some kind of a unit in the Indian Ministry of External Affairs handling this. Uh, you know, and then it, it got a, a bit ugly, dashing my host, because I really thought that was the revival of SARC right there. Um, but, you know, so uh, I think India has been trying to reach out to partners, and if it doesn't work with SARC, it's trying to reach out to other partners. And, but it's not just limited to its own region, it's going all the way to ASEAN, it's going to the EU, um, you know, uh, that's just the thing. I think India feels a bit limited uh, in its own region uh, in South Asia because of some of the conflicts and so on. But it's not just India, it's other countries in South Asia having their own alliances. So Pakistan has its own preference, uh, you know, preferred frameworks. And so, yeah, yeah. So that complicates things. Right. But no self-reliance, I don't think it's true, really. Uh, no no to... country in today's world can be self-reliant. And as you say, the outreach that all the countries in the region, including India, uh, are making towards other institutions, other organizations, and other governments is a sign that people do believe in globalization, whether they may articulate it differently in today's challenging environment. Sunil, I would really like you to come in because we're coming towards the end of our, uh, of our conference. Um, I have a question coming in from Mr. Singh, Suhasini Singh. I wonder if Suhasini, you can actually join uh, yourself and ask the question. Otherwise, it's about, uh, yes, if you can. Otherwise, it's about um, trade agreements with EU countries in South Asia. Um, and, and is there a possibility, uh, Yanis, for you of having a regional agreement uh, between the EU and South Asia on trade? I think we're not there yet, but I leave you to answer it. Uh, first of all, to have a, an agreement, we have to have somebody who is mandated for that yeah. so, to start with. So in reality, uh, as we start now, we, we also plan to have uh, as part also of our roadmap 2025 uh, with our strategic partners with India, we explore the possibilities to see how we can really advance on the trade area. In fact, it's only it's in a few days, actually, the day after tomorrow, where I think that uh, we have a high level meeting to dialogue to see on where we stand on the trade agenda. And when I say trade agenda, I'm also talking about uh, investment. Agenda. So this is, and I, I cannot say much, but the hopes are there. There is uh, a determination, I think, from both sides to find um, uh, an agreement to see how we can really progress. After 12 uh, years. And, but, uh, but I cannot say anything. Uh, whatever I can say, it's really, it remains to be seen. Uh, but I certainly there is a goodwill from both sides. And in mm -hmm. fact, we appreciate the benefits of an agreement. And also, I think that um, it is something that certainly will stay on the agenda. There's no doubt about that. But of course, uh, it is not an easy part. 
particularly with a partner with the same economy of the size like India and also from the European Union. So, uh, yes, on the bilateral side, uh, and of course, in terms of regional integration, I, we, I think that uh, there is no comparison but, uh, with, of uh, South Asia with, for example, ASEAN in connection with uh, this type of partnership. So, uh, yeah. South Asia is far. Uh, I will stop here because the question was only on the trade. <laughs> no, but I, exactly. And uh, even with ASEAN, as we all know, the arrangements, the agreements that are being signed with Vietnam, Singapore, and that are being negotiated with uh, Indonesia and Malaysia are bilateral. The region to region deal is still there as an ambition, as a goal to be followed but it's very difficult to put into action. I have Ambassador Mahbub Saleh of Bangladesh uh, here uh, as one of the, uh, in the, in the, as a participant. And I was wondering, Ambassador Mahbub, would you like to come in? Because uh, I'm having difficulty connecting with Sunil and I wanted a voice from the region and your um, wonderful um, Joint Secretary has had to leave. So Ambassador Mahbub, if you can connect, uh, I wouldn't mind having a quick intervention from yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. No. Okay. Mushfi is a secretary. Uh, secretary East, not a joint secretary East. East. Yes. No. No. Secretary East. So. Okay. He, secretary East. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, very, I, I'm not a I'm not a bureaucrat. I tend to get <laughs> lost in <laughs> yeah, in terms. Anyway, ambassador, senior. you yes. are the ambassador. Go ahead. No, thank you. Just uh, uh, a couple of couple of points. Um, uh, of course, EU's engagement with uh, SARC is always welcome. Uh, but I think in 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 the in the near reality that uh, we all are uh, uh, witnessing uh, in the region uh, and with the uh, new uh, approach. Um, of, of Indo-Pacific and uh, different countries. And uh, of course, EU is also considering uh, its own uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, perhaps uh, it would be uh, a good idea to engage uh, uh, with BIMSTEC uh, as the, the prime regional organization there uh, for uh, engagement, a fruitful or effective engagement. We, we have seen SARC for 30, nearly 36 years. Uh, I think we all know uh, what uh, uh, was the expectation and uh, what has been uh, achieved. So from that perspective also, uh, I think the Bay of Bengal region, uh, if you could, could uh, visualize that as, as a region, uh, the countries uh, in and around that, uh, are members of, of BIMSTEC and also uh, those countries would uh, uh, fit into your uh, views, thoughts, ideas, and strategies when you formulate uh, the EU's uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, strategy. Uh, because the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, uh, I can speak for Bangladesh uh, uh, very clearly that uh, from the highest political level, um, our narrative is very clear. We believe in a free, open, inclusive, peaceful, and secure Indo-Pacific with shared prosperity for all. So that is perhaps a, um, a pretty uh, open um, sort of narrative and which can, which can certainly uh, fit into uh, the EU's uh, thoughts and ideas and we can, we can have uh, great cooperations and BIMSTEC would fit into that pretty well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mahbub. Uh, we're coming to the end of our conversation and I just want to say whether, Pascaline, you have to leave as well if you want to have a final word and then I'd give the, uh, a quick minute to uh, Yanis as well. Just a quick word from you. Sunil, okay. if you can come in, that would be very nice, but you'll have to make the effort now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so... Um... I would give a number of recommendations. The, the first one would be uh, to foster better mutual knowledge of one another. So to give attention to the mutual perceptions, to uh, foster better mutual understanding of the local context. Um, try to understand to, to what extent the priorities in South Asia match, match uh, the European uh, priorities. And a specific recommendation of mine to the EU would be to continue funding perception studies because they're very, very useful, I think, 
uh, but also perhaps studies uh, that look into the historical development of regional organization in South Asia and beyond, and the interrelationship between these. So we understand the local councils better, um, continue the think tank training initiatives in, in Delhi and maybe extend it because that's a way uh, to have partners, you know, from both South Asia, you know, and Europe work together. I think this is really excellent, rely more on delegations for local knowledge, I would say, and certainly focus on specific fields of mutual interest and expertise. We cannot do everything, so it's a good idea to focus on specific fields. Uh, I would continue the cooperation um, at, uh, you know, um, primary and secondary school levels, including the attention to girls' education. Uh, I would also recommend more partnership between universities in South Asia and between EU and South Asian universities. I, I, I really like the South Asian university and what it has achieved, actually. Maybe because I'm in the College of Europe here, so of course, it's kind of kind of spirit. And I would give uh, attention to health, uh, the environment, climate change uh, challenges, food security, and how these challenges are interlinked, actually, as demonstrated by the current uh, health uh, crisis. But most of all, I think what you need is mutual respect between South Asia and European partners. And on this ba basis, I think we can uh, achieve much. Thank you very much, Pascaline. Thank you also for the wise counsel, if I may say so. Very good advice. Yanis, your final word. Thank you. Uh, just to mention to you that uh, the European Union always favors the partnership with international organizations, regional organizations, because we see them as a vehicle for regional integration, uh, also solution of problems and conflicts, etc. And I think we have a lot of paradigms for that. Our experience is a bit mixed sometimes because we see that in certain cases there is no much result at the end of the day because what we seek as first part of the support is through organizations not to support the organizations themselves so there is a bit of a difference there and let's face it and to be, to be frank I think that every regional organization is as strong as its member states wish it to be and we cannot force the member states to make an organization stronger if they don't wish to do. They can see the benefits on the other hand, and this is what we try to demonstrate. And I think that there is a lot of room to demonstrate benefits in South Asia. And I look forward to see how we can really design our program in the years to come with the support of delegations who also, I would like to reassure you, um, outreach all members of civil society in every single country. Uh, they've done it, if they've done it already, they will certainly do it. Uh, in order exactly to see how we can really address this uh, part of um, uh, of the regional integration and agenda. So uh, certainly the focus is on the national, but we know that the interdependencies are there, the needs are there, and I would like to see how we can really also from other hat also on the regional side, how we can really be more meaningful and more impactful on this uh, front. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Yanis. Sunil is back. <laughs> Sunil, it's wonderful to see you now. Your final word, please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sada. You know, like, uh, you know, like, I would like to say, like, two things, you know. One of the things is, like, you know, uh, Europe and, you know, like, uh, you and the SARC has somehow, the, there, there has been the gap between the uh, European Union and the SARC Association. So what I feel is that, like, there has to be the annual dialogue between European Union and uh, SARC so that there could be, the, you know, like, SARC uh, European Union, you know, this track, uh, you know, one dialogue uh, can be initiated, uh, you know, to bring the, you know, like the two, uh, you know, like a regional entities together in days to come, and that could be the biennial event, you know, that could have a very larger meaning, and that can bring, you know, all of the, you know, like uh, uh, governments from Europe and from South Asia together. And the second thing is, you know, like what I feel is like there has been, a, you know, like a somehow the European banks and the, some of the European investors, they have been coming to Nepal, uh, you know, slowly for the investments, basically in the energy sectors. And uh, European is also... We have a bad connection again, Sunil. But I think, thank you very much uh, for that intervention and uh, for your final words. Um, <laughs> Just, uh, yes. Prime investor uh, who invested uh, uh, kilometer transmission line in Nepal, uh, which I spent of Nepal. 
Right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Pascaline had to leave. Uh, let me just uh, thank you all uh, for joining us, the participants as well as the panelists, Yanis and Sunil and Pascaline and Madame Mashvi, who had to leave. Uh, you know, we've uh, let me just round up very, very quickly for in, in a minute. We say often, uh, don't we, that it takes two to tango. Um, and in this case, of course, uh, the, the, there is a difficulty to tango together, but sometimes maybe we have to force people onto the dance floor. Um, I have done so myself in several occasions. So I think perhaps that is an approach that we could take is to find the functional uh, cooperation as a, start, as, as a stepping point. We've talked about a region that is very complicated and very complex, but also a region uh, which is very resilient with a very strong middle class, um, which is perhaps affected by the pandemic, but which is very resilient. Um, we've also talked about um, the need to focus on cooperation and climate change, connectivity, education, and the global economic recovery, global supply chains, the difficulty of changing mindsets, but also the need to change mindsets so we can actually have an Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which does not ignore or sideline all of South Asia. Um, two suggestions. Uh, one that Pascaline has made, I think Yanis is a very good one, is also of perhaps taking this kind of conversation forward in more uh, think tank initiatives, which are not just about dealing with India, Pakistan or Bangladesh or Nepal separately, but encouraging people to come forward like we did, Sunil, you and I, and EPC and IDEA, um, to talk about certain things um, as a stepping stone towards real cooperation. And finally, a very, um, let's say, ambitious thought I had um, was we have an envoy at the European Union level for different regions, uh, for ASEAN, for Central Asia, uh, Africa, uh, the Great Lakes area, et cetera, et cetera. I know that envoys are no longer in fashion, but perhaps we need to have someone uh, at the External Action Service looking uh, like you do, Yanis, uh, at South Asia, but making that um, very proactive in terms of actually engaging interactively with South Asia and the different organizations, not just SARC, but perhaps all the others we've talked about as well. So with that thought, uh, I'd like to leave all of you. I'd like to thank you all again for joining us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and learned from this conversation just as much as I did. Sunil, thank you for your cooperation and uh, see you all very soon at another EPC event. Bye-bye.